Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Samuel from the Applied Security team. Uh, today to talk about the Lazy Programmer's Guide to Secure Computing is uh, Mark Stiegler from HP Research. Uh, he's going to be talking about a bunch of techniques uh, to get towards uh, decomposable security. And uh, he's a great person to talk about this because he's been trying to, uh, and you know, with a lot of success, get that onto systems as complex as the Windows operating system um, as part of the Polaris project, which you guys should definitely check out if you're interested in uh, computer security. And so, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, the key today is to talk not so much about security, but to talk about laziness. Uh, it is, it is uh, generally well known by everyone in the world that security requires vigilance, and that the only solution for vigilance, or to, for security is vigilance, and you must combine that vigilance with a variety of special purpose uh, exotic APIs with which you write special purpose code that has no purpose whatsoever except to apply security vigilance. Here we are going to consider an alternative. We're going to consider focusing on laziness rather than on vigilance. For one thing, laziness has a very striking advantage over vigilance, which is that you've always got it available to you 24 by 7. So even at 3 o'clock in the morning when the ca caffeine has run out, you can still be lazy even though you can't be vigilant. And we're going to combine that laziness. In fact, the foundation of our laziness is going to be simply using the object-oriented techniques that you use every day all the time. So let's go on. Uh, we're going to divide this talk into three sections. We're going to show how laziness, appropriately applied, actually solves security problems at three different levels of abstraction. We're going to uh, talk about security in the single address space, uh, the sort of security that you need to run when you're doing a mashup uh, with several different pieces of software from se several different uh, third party vendors who you do not know how much you should trust. We're going to then look at uh, lazy security across in the distributed uh, system domain, uh, including client server systems, service-to-service -service service systems and peer-to-peer -peer systems. Finally we, will look, finally, we will look at security in the medium to large application and see how these same techniques help make your, uh, app, your larger applications more robust in the face of serious professional attackers. We have one paradigm that we use to cover all of these things. And we're going to introduce four rules of laziness along the way. Now, these are not the only rules of laziness. Laziness, perfect laziness, is a goal to be strived for. And we will never achieve perfection in the field of laziness. But we're going to take some important steps in that direction. So the first laziness rule is uh, pretty obvious. Uh, even, even programmers of very modest uh, success in achieving laziness know this rule uh, implicitly. Uh, here we have a, a function. The function uh, area re receives an x and a y and returns the area of that rectangle. And now we're going to look at a hard worker who is going to use that function. OK, this guy is not lazy. And what he does is, first of all, understand that this guy has a password and a Z and an X and a Y. So what this guy is going to do is he's going to invoke the area function and he's going to pass the X and the Y and the Z and the password. Now this will work. It works perfectly fine, but it's not at all lazy. Why is he typing all those extra keys? Why is, pass why is he passing all those extra parameters? That's working too hard. So any, any sensible person would, of course, just simply pass the x and the y because that's all the function needs. <clears throat> now the decision to not pass the argument z is simply a matter of laziness. 
But the decision not to pass the password is not only lazy, but it's actually a security decision. We have decided not to cast the password to the four winds. Okay, so, uh, so here laziness has, has uh, served the purpose of uh, being more secure. And we, we, we run this, I mean, it's, it's obvious, and you know, we, have, we have a rule for this in programming, and it's simply don't give an object something that it doesn't need to do the job you want it to do for you, right? Don't, don't give it to them if they don't need it. Now that rule is so special and so powerful and so important in the security world that it has a special name. It is called variously the principle of least privilege, the principle of least authority. We, who practice proper laziness, call it POLA because we use this concept so much on a daily basis that we are too lazy to use more than two syllables to describe it. Okay, so POLA. Now, the, the idea of POLA is very simple. Uh, again, you, uh, you, you, gi you give the object or the person everything that they need to do the job that you want them to do and nothing else. So this is really, Pola is the tip of a razor's edge, wherein to the left of the uh, razor tip you have the area where there's not enough authority uh, you haven't given the guy enough stuff to get his work done. And on the, on the other side, we have handed the guy more power than he needs to get the work done. Now, handing the guy just a little bit of extra power is not a big problem. You know, handing the Z value to that area function would not have been an issue. Uh, but as you move farther and farther to the right here, you are increasing the amount of abusable power, and now you're in trouble. Meanwhile, over here on the left-hand side, uh, since it, you can't get your work done unless you do something radical like engage in credential sharing. And at that point, suddenly you leap from the left-hand side where you can't get your work done all the way to the far right-hand side where you're getting your work done, but you have maximized the potential of the other party to abuse you. So I, uh, a, a, an example was recently uh, pointed out to me over at HP, there's a business uh, achieving some considerable success on the web, I am told. Uh, this business uh, does, uh, looks, looks at all of your, uh, uh, gets the data from all of your financial uh, services, aggregates it, and shows you beautiful views of your financial situation. And this sounds really very nice, and I would like it myself, except that in order to do this for you, you have to give them all of your credentials for all of your financial services. So they, so they wind up with full authority. Not only can they show you how well you're doing, but they can change it for you. Okay. Now, not, uh, neither I nor anyone who pays attention to my advice is ever going to use this service because of this uh, gross amount of abusable power that has to be granted to them in order to give you this service. So there's another name for POLA, and uh, that name is Maximum Business Opportunity. So now we have the same principle playing out with slightly different words to each of several different audiences. The security people call it POLA, the marketing people call it Maximum Business Opportunity, we, the programmers, just simply call it, don't give them anything they don't need. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, here on the left-hand side, uh, we're going to use the value out of a table. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to send that function, the table and the index into the table uh, so that it can extract that value and use it. While it's there, of course, we pass a whole table, it's going to grab up the password, and why not? Since the password is one of the elements in the table, okay? Now, an ordinary OO programmer 
would never have this problem because the ordinary OO programmer would uh, knows that for modularity's sake in this circumstance, you would not pass the index in the table, you would just simply pass the element. And so here we are, we're, we're receiving the element and here we are, we're just simply shipping uh, the particular element that we wanted them to have. So far so good, again very obvious. Um, a, an, an implementation of POLA for the purpose of laziness and modularity. Okay, now I'm going to surprise some of you. I know this is going to come as a shock, but laziness is not always identical to security. Okay. Uh, and so here's an example. This is something that I myself have done. Uh, now suppose we have this table, but this time instead of using the value out of the table, we expect this other function to actually update the value in the table. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to send in the table and the index so that the guy can write the new value into the table. Of course, he's still going to grab up the password while he's there. And he's also going to corrupt our copy of the password so that he can sell the password back to us at a modest fee later in the day. Uh, <clears throat> okay, no problem. Well, a serious problem, but this is definitely lazy. Okay. So at this point we have to introduce a new distinction and that is the distinction between the professional lazy programmer, the guy who takes his laziness very seriously, and the amateur lazy programmer. The amateur lazy programmer has a lot of trouble telling the distinction between what is lazy, what is careless, what is sloppy, what is thoughtless. Okay, what will get him into trouble the following day? The professional, the professionally lazy programmer knows that yes, most of the work that he could do today would probably be wasted by the time tomorrow came around, but every once in a while he'll look at something and say, I know that if I don't do this right the first time, you know, I can do, I, I can do this right, I can spend an extra half hour now, or I'm going to spend a week of agony tomorrow. Oh. Oh, 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 I don't, I don't want to go there. I'm going to go professional. I'm going to uh, up my game in laziness. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend just a little time now. Okay. So now let's go back to that example where we're updating that table. And suppose that we already know, professionally lazy programmers as, that we are. And I see a lot of laziness out in this audience. So I'm very excited to have you all here. Uh, the, uh, uh, suppose that we just know that the data structure is going to be modified in the course of the upcoming weeks. Uh, it's probably going to eventually wind up being an update to uh, a relational database, uh, but we don't really know for sure. And so what we want to do is minimize the amount of code we're going to have to modify when this maintenance phase comes around and, and bites us. Well, in that case, we might want to consider doing something different. Instead of passing in the index and the table, what we might want to do, what we would surely want to do in this case, is pass in a function that accepts a value and updates the table here locally so that when the modification to the data structure uh, comes rolling around, I don't have to modify the function that is doing the editing. I only have to modify this one line of code. Okay. Now at this point, once again, we have achieved the principle of least authority. The guy, the, 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 this, 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 the, this function that is going to be doing the editing only has the authority to update the specific element that he's supposed to update and he does not have the authority to uh, manipulate our password field. So, <clears throat> uh, so this, is, uh, this is the professional version for making your system more maintainable. And now here's the interesting thing, which is that this, uh, this version isn't any longer than the first version. 
So maybe it was just as lazy all along. Okay. Okay, but the problem gets harder. Okay, now we're going to bring in a subcontractor. And the subcontractor uh, is going to have to do our editing function, but there are some important rules, okay? He's got to only modify that element one time, and when he modifies it that one time, he must notify us. Well, we could just simply document it for him and pray to the gods of programming that uh, he pays attention to the documentation. We actually have three different choices here. Uh, we could just give him the power to manipulate everything, which is, in security terms, the moral equivalent of giving him our user ID and password so that he can do one little function, uh, you know, the same idea of I've got to give him all of my financial credentials so that he can read the data. We could give him two little functions like the ones that we just saw, the updater and the notifier, but he could still accidentally forget to notify or he could update twice, or we could give him one reliably correct function that does exactly what you need him to do and nothing else. This is an example of becoming meta-lazy because at this point, we are wise enough as professionally lazy programmers to understand that that other guy is lazy too, and in particular, he's too lazy to read the documentation. Okay. So let's take a look at what, uh, and, and how we might uh, go about solving this problem. Uh, this time we're going to hand him an edit function again. Notice that even with these new uh, requirements, we did not have to change the, the, uh, the contract for the editing function, okay? The, the contract remains the same, okay? Very, very simplifying of the maintenance problem once more. The red line here is the boundary uh, in the reliance set. Uh, we in programming would refer to this as the reliance set wherein the things, the, the, the correctness of our table depends on all of the things that are below the line but should not be dependent on the things that are above the line. In the security world, this would be referred to as the trust boundary. Okay, so we're going to come down here and we're going to make, uh, again, we're going to manufacture an edit function uh, that uh, specifies a particular element in the table and a sp particular listener who will be receiving the notification. Here's the guy who's receiving the notification and here's the, uh, the function that manufactures the function that we're going to send. So what happens here is uh, this, this, this function maker receives the index in the table and the observer. It loads the table into a revocable, uh, ver uh, in, 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 into another variable, and it manufactures a function which, when it gets the new value, updates the table, then sets the variable to null so that the next time the guy tries to do an update, it will throw a null pointer exception. And then finally, it notifies the observer, okay? So it's all packed in here. Now this time you'll notice that I am sending the index in the table to a separate function, which was something that I avoided earlier. Uh, this time I'm doing a s separate set of trade-offs. One of the things that has changed is that implicitly earlier I was assuming that the reliance set was within the boundaries of the individual function. This time the reliance uh, set and the trust boundary is in a different location and I've extracted it so that if I have other functions down here that are also going to have to send values up to this guy, they can simply reuse this function maker. Uh, so we're getting more reusability down here inside our trust domain. So here we are. In each one of these cases, we have implemented POLA, but each time we've implemented POLA for a different reason that had nothing to do with security. So the first time we implemented it strictly for the purpose of being lazy. 
The second time we implemented it, we implemented it for the sake of maintaining object-oriented modularity. The third time we implemented it, we implemented it for the sake of enhancing our maintainability. And last, we, we implemented it to improve our reliability in the face of multiple people and multiple organizations. There are so many different reasons for implementing POLA in addition to the security properties that we got each time, protecting the value of our password and our other special data, uh, uh, that, uh, that one has to ask the question, is POLA really a security principle or is it just a darn good engineering practice? So let's stand back and talk as if we were security people for a moment. Now security people, you know, I mean security people do usernames and passwords. <clears throat> Where'd all the authentication go? We never passed, we never set an ACL, we never passed an object ID and a password to prove that my object was uh, authenticated as being the right object to be allowed to send a message to your object. Uh, where, where, where'd all the authentication go? And the answer, of course, is that we, we weren't doing all that kind of authentication that security people are famous for. What we were doing was what we refer to as authorization-based access control as opposed to authentication-based access control. With authorization-based access control, you do not go around authenticating the guy every 15 minutes, okay? Instead, you authenticate him once when you hand him the authority, and once you've authenticated him and handed him the authority, you don't have to authenticate him anymore. He uses the authority, it's all, it's all cool, it's good. And in that sense, it is very much like the object-oriented, professionally lazy programmer. It's not merely simpler, it's more composable and it's more POLA, again, because it's simply object-oriented programming done with a little bit of extra sincerity. So now we're going to talk about the remarkable properties of the ordinary object-oriented message send. But before we do that, I'm going to talk just briefly about the letter envelope, okay? So here's the letter envelope. It's been under evolution for over 2,000 years, okay? I would like to see us achieve the same quality of security as the letter envelope in less than 2,000 years. You're welcome to join me in that hope. Uh, so I'm going to look at this envelope from the point of view of my mother-in-law and from the point of view of a security guru. So if you ask my mother-in-law why, uh, why the envelope is opaque, well, she says, so that the mailman doesn't get confused with all of the writing that would get in the way of him reading the address. Okay, the security guy says, oh, that's your encryption. Okay, you ask my mother-in-law, so why do we have this flap that seals down on the back? She says, so the letter doesn't fall out. The security guy says, that's my tamper-resistant tamper detection system. On the front, in the top left-hand corner, you ask my mother-in-law, well, what's the stamp for? And she says, so that, the, so that the postal office can get paid. The security guy says, ah, oh, that's my spam filter. And finally, you ask my mother-in-law what the point of this little clear panel is in the middle of the envelope, and she says, so that the mail guy can read the address. The security guy says, that's my principle of least authority grant of just enough authority to the routing system so that they can deliver the mail. Here is the very interesting thing about all of this. All of the security in the letter envelope is serving some other function in addition to the security purpose. And that is what I have been showing you down all the way through here. At every step, 
the, act, the, 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 the same thing that you had to do for security was something that you had to do for some other reason. And if you, and if you do this properly, then your security disappears into the background. And people are not annoyed by it anymore. And people don't have to do credential sharing anymore. And everybody is less vulnerable. So now we're going to look with our new eyes at the object-oriented reference, which is also very interesting from a security perspective. So here we're looking at the object Alice passing the foo message to Bob that's carrying the argument Carol. And we can see it down here. Basically, Alice is saying bob.foo, here's Carol. Okay? So what's interesting here? Well, first of all, when Alice sends foo to Bob, have you ever worried that some other object in the middle of the system was going to, inter was going to eavesdrop on that message being sent and either read the Carol reference or, or modify the Carol re reference and maybe slip a Dave in there? Of course not. That's not what, that, that can't happen in object-oriented programming. It's, well, in memory, safe object-oriented programming. So that is giving us the moral equivalent of what a security guy achieves by encryption. Uh, when Alice sends the message foo to Bob, is she afraid that, are you afraid that the message will accidentally be rerouted to Mike? Uh, you know, is there you know, some sort of uh, centralized uh, service, naming service like DNS, whose cache can be poisoned in the middle of your object-oriented program and cause the, your, your, the message that you're sending to Bob to go off to Mike? No, okay, so that is what a security guy would achieve by authenticating the recipient. And the only way Alice can possibly be sending a reference to Bob is if somebody else who already had a reference to Bob has explicitly and voluntarily decided to give Alice a reference to Bob, which is to say Alice is authorized to send messages to Bob and manipulate Bob. Okay, so we have all the essential characteristics of authorization-based access control embedded right in the object-oriented paradigm. You don't need anything else. Alas, doesn't work hardly at all. And the reason is that object-oriented programming languages, all the popular ones, uniformly supply access mechanisms that break the object-oriented paradigm and in doing so, they, they discard all of the cool security properties that you have acquired for free in embracing OO in the first place. So JavaScript, uh, we had a lot of fun with this. I, I did a uh, tri uh, re uh, review of this presentation for some of the people who have practiced uh, hacking JavaScript systems. And uh, this was, uh, there was an argument about which one of the ways of breaking the examples I've shown you already uh, would, would be the most fun way of presenting how breakable JavaScript is. This is one of them. Uh, the function area, which is receiving only the x and the y, throws an error, looks at the stack, extracts all the arguments uh, in the lazy user, and grabs the password. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, so it seemed real good for a while there. And I have really good news for you. Uh, Google has been the leader in developing a rewriter, the Kaha rewriter for JavaScript that fixes all of these violations of the object-oriented principles in JavaScript. So if you feed JavaScript code into, into the Kaha rewriter and it comes out the other side rather than being rejected, you now have JavaScript that is doing two things. One is it's enforcing the security principles, but the other one is the, the way it's enforcing the security principles is it's simply enforcing the object-oriented engineering best practices that you depend on anyway. So, 
So we have more than just uh, Kaha here. There are actually a lot of uh, verifiers and rewriters that are floating around in the world, uh, some of the ones that are amusing for different reasons. Uh, the Kaha rewriter was uh, developed by Google. Uh, the largest user of it at the moment is actually Yahoo. They use uh, Kaha to, to uh, confine all the widgets on all of their pages. Uh, the AdSafe uh, verifier was also written for JavaScript that was actually developed at Yahoo. Uh, Joey, developed at UC Berkeley, uh, is a verifier that uh, enforces the same, uh, same discipline for Java. And uh, there's a couple of exotic ones. There's a verifier for OCaml, and the only reason why that one's very interesting is that OCaml runs at approximately C++ speeds. So if you need to write code that has these kinds of security properties that runs as fast as C++, then uh, you could investigate using OCaml. Well, okay, so let's step back from laziness for a moment and ask another question, and that is, so you guys, you know, you've been working for weeks adding functionality to the software, and it's getting to be a grind. And you're looking over at the security guys, and the security guys have these really big APIs and lots of documentation that they're reading, and you're thinking, you know, that looks like a lot of fun. And you'd like to do some security work for a change of pace rather than just simply uh, you know, implementing more functionality for the users. So, uh, uh, so, so is there any way of having fun doing security anymore when you move into uh, this, this approach? Uh, the answer is you're not going to have as much fun. Uh, but you are going to have some fun. One of the things that you will need to do that's not quite lazy is learn a little bit about uh, the various uh, patterns of secure cooperation that have been developed across the course of the uh, last couple of decades for authorization-based access control. Uh, this is one here. Uh, so here we have, an, uh, we have a, a slot maker. A slot is just simply a variable with a... Uh, 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 it's, it's an object with a, with, with, with a value inside. You can set the value. You can get the value. Uh, and here's the thing that makes slots. And the slot, once you've made a slot, it is an authority, right? You have read and write authority on the slot once you have, the box, once you have reference to the object. And one of the uh, things that you've got here is object.freeze. OK, we were talking earlier about uh, the fact that JavaScript actually doesn't supply these properties, but Kaha does. Object.freeze is a method supplied by the Kaha rewriter. And if you freeze an object uh, when you construct it, then you can't do any of the really funky things to that object that will bust it open and, and steal its private variables. So that's a very important uh, piece of making this all work right in JavaScript. The, um, uh, anyway, so here's the slot. Now suppose you want to hand somebody a revocable authority to that slot. Here's a general purpose uh, uh, revocable slot maker. So you hand this guy a slot. Uh, it returns a frozen object that has a set method and a get method that's simply forward to the inner slot. And it includes, at the end, a revoke method. When you invoke the revoke method, it sets the slot to null. And thereafter, any attempt to do a get or a set will throw back a null pointer exception. OK. Um, so and then, uh, then you can make a revocable slot simply by uh, making a slot and then, making, then invoking make revocable on that. And now you've got a re revocable slot. You can mix and match these things. Uh, if I hand you a revocable access to my slot, and you want to turn around and hand a separately revocable access to my slot to somebody else, you just simply wrap your revocable slot with another revoker, OK, hand it off to the next guy, and now you can revoke his slot separately from revoking your own slot access. OK, onward to uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see how this works uh, when we go distributed. So the first thing we're going to do to 
implement these same principles in a distributed context is we're going to reproduce the virtues of the object-oriented reference in the distributed environment. So you'll remember that the marvel of object-oriented references was that there was no man in the middle, uh, the recipient was authenticated, and the sender was authorized. So here we have two examples of uh, web keys. Uh, the, let's see, a the, uh, couple of the things that the two kinds of web keys have in common, they're both HTTPS, so they're encrypted, so there's no man in the middle attack. The other thing is that the actual resource has an unguessable name, and so the only way you can find and access that resource is if somebody who already has access to the resource explicitly hands you a reference to it. Okay, just like in the, uh, uh, in the object-oriented uh, shared memory case. And so uh, we know that anybody who can reach the resource has been authorized. The thing that uh, d separates them is, uh, let me talk about the, uh, 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 is that uh, with the simple one, you use some random uh, uh, standard domain name. Uh, and you depend on a certificate authority to assure that uh, uh, if somebody goes there and there's some DNS uh, uh, ca cash poisoning going on, uh, that, uh, that the certificate authority check will uh, throw up the exception dialog box that the user can then click OK on. On the other hand, so that anyway, so that's one version of the web key. In the other version, you actually embed the fingerprint of the public-private key pair for the service that hosts this authority right there in the, uh, uh, in the URL. And this is, uh, I, I refer to this as the professional version because uh, in the, pro the professional version here is for people who are too lazy to coordinate their activities with a certificate authority, okay? Uh, the user of the professional version here can use self-signed certificates. In one of the applications that I built that used this, we were actually uh, uh, building a system where we were putting servers on every individual person's machine. Indeed, we were putting individual servers with individual cer uh, certificates on every machine for every user. And so attempting to, uh, so, so being able to use self-signed certificates in that, in that system was not merely a matter of being lazy, it was a matter of being able to survive. Okay. So in any event, uh, the, the, uh, uh, in either of these cases, either the certificate authority or the fingerprint is ensuring that the recipient is authenticated. And now you've got all the properties of an object-oriented message send. And these, uh, the professional version of the web key is implemented on the Waterkin uh, open source platform. Um, uh, if you're interested in playing with these things, go out and check out that site, or ask me, or ask Tyler Close, yes. Sorry, uh, to go back, what is, it, what is that first part of the domain, it's a fingerprint? Yes, it's the fingerprint for the public-private key pair uh, of the, uh, th that is being held by the server, by the service that holds the resource. So what happens is uh, you, you use the fingerprint to challenge the guy to prove that he holds the private key. Only if he proves that he holds the private key do you then reveal the, uh, the name of the resource. So here are some examples of uh, Java code in the Waterkin system. The uh, Waterkin platform is uh, Java-based. Uh, and uh, we have reproduced uh, the slot example that we had done earlier in JavaScript. Uh, so over here on the left-hand side, we have a slot uh, with a get and a set. In the, mi uh, in the, mi in the uh, far side, we have a revocable slot uh, that uh, is both, uh, both of the type slot and is also of the type uh, revoker. So it has the get and the set method and the revoke method and it works approximately the same way. In the middle we have a read only version of the slot, uh, which uh, when given a slot, 
Uh, what it does is it forwards get requests to the inner slot, but it throws an exception when you try to do a set. Okay, and so this is a read-only version, and again, you can mix and match these. Okay, these, you can build arbitrarily sophisticated, compo dynamically composable security policies out of these simple building blocks. So let's take a look at this for a slightly larger example. This is digital money. Okay, it's digital money secure that fits on a PowerPoint slide. I'd like to see other implementations of digital money that fit on a single PowerPoint slide. Okay, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and we come down here. This is based on the PURST protocol. Uh, PURST protocol was designed for authorization-based access uh, control systems uh, like 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is that I have a purse and I can withdraw money. If I withdraw money from my purse, I will create a new purse and put some of my money into that purse and then I can hand that second purse to you. And, if, and then you have a purse and you can deposit the money from the purse that I handed to you into your purse and now it's your money. Okay, so that's the purse protocol for doing digital money. And so we have a purse with a, with a balance and uh, we come down here and so we've got uh, the three methods. We've got get balance which just simply returns the balance. Uh, this is all done in a, uh, again, in a Waterkin system. Uh, we're returning a promise for an integer for reasons having to do with the way a Waterkin server uh, returns values over the wire. It has nothing to do with our security discussion. Uh, let's see, and uh, uh, we've got the withdraw method, which manufactures a new purse uh, with some amount of money in it uh, and returns the new purse and deducts the appropriate amount from our balance. Finally, we have the deposit method, which receives a purse. Uh, we deduct the appropriate amount of money, uh, the, 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 all the money from the purse that we received. Uh, we set that purse to zero balance, and then we add that amount of money to our purse. So where's the security in here? Well, you know, I looked at this and I thought, well, there are a couple of things that look suspiciously like security. Uh, one is, uh, is these assert statements. Uh, I've got this assert to make sure that the amount of money is less than the balance and more than zero. Uh, and a security guy would say, well, that's to protect you from the malicious attacker who is going to try to corrupt your, uh, your, your money supply. Uh, but uh, you know what, I look at that and I say, well, I'm just trying to make sure that the program runs correctly. Okay, uh, uh, similarly down here we do another assert. Uh, this assert is to make sure that it, we didn't do a, an integer rollover. We're using pure integers here, so if we, if, we were if we managed to build a system that had enough money put into a single purse so that it rolled over, uh, you'd, have a, you'd have a problem. Again, an attacker might try to attack that, but I need to fix it so that it's correct. The closest real thing to a uh, security item is when I take the purse that I've received in the deposit and I cast it to a concrete type rather than an interface type before manipulating it. Now, <clears throat> the security guy says the reason you're doing that cast is so that uh, uh, is so that uh, you know that it's a real purse. It's not a forged purse. Okay, uh, but the other reason for doing that cast is I was too lazy to put a set balance method on the purse so that I could manually set the balance on the purse interface type. And this actually takes less code than doing it the other way. So yeah, it's security, but it's also lazy because it's less code. So let's take a look at what this stuff looks like. 
when it's brought out to the user. Okay, now at this point, we're into the sing-along part. Uh, most of you received, I handed out authority at the beginning of this session. Okay, it looks like Mike has one left. Uh, so in any event, so, so this is the sing-along part. I have given you two authorities, and one of them, we'll, we'll be, be looking at both of them uh, right here in a moment. Uh, so I'm going to come up here into my secure bookmarks, and I'm going to pop open one of my web keys. Uh, I'm going to pop open this purse. OK. Did you catch me typing in my username and password? Which I had forgotten. OK. So I'm going to withdraw some money from my purse. So I'm going to withdraw uh, 14 credits. And here's a purse with 14 credits in it. And I'm going to show you that it has 14 credits in it because I'm going to open it in a new window. There it is, and it has 14 credits in it. And now I'm going to withdraw seven credits from that. Now I'm going to deposit that into the first purse. Okay. Any questions about how that works? Everybody understand why that's actually a secure transaction? Okay. So anyway. Well, let me move the rest of the money back up here. Every time I run this demo, I run the risk of leaving some money on the table. OK, and uh, so in any event, so that's the purse demo. Very lightweight digital cash, yes. What? What's that? You tried to deposit the same purse twice. Oh, did I? OK. And it didn't work. And it didn't work. Isn't that satisfying? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a sweaty moment. OK. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what next? Okay, now, here's the other, uh, well, here's, here's my authority. I've given you all an authority we will look at in a moment on one of my servers. This is the share shell. This is a, an approximation of a bash, a remote bash command line. It's a, it serves approximately the same purpose as SSH. It's not actually quite SSH, but you know, it serves much the same purpose. Uh, and I'm going to come down here and you see that I have this field where I can type in a, uh, a command, uh, a shell command, and it'll come out and it'll uh, pop all that stuff up for me. Okay, so now one of the things that I have here in my shell, in addition to a place where I can type in arbitrary commands, I also have a list of quick commands. So I can come up here and just simply uh, list the, uh, uh, come up here and uh, run a command. There we have it. Uh, and <clears throat> so far, so good. Uh, now let's take a look at how I manage this. This is my, this is, this is, uh, this is the attenuated authorities. This is my, uh, my uh, window for uh, creating and managing attenuated authorities for other people on my HP server. So here we have uh, two of these things. One is a, uh, an, an authority that I handed to Alan, who is a guy I work with. I don't trust him hardly at all. He's sitting right here in the audience. Uh, and uh, so I gave him very limited authorities, far less than I'm giving you guys. Uh, and, uh, and here's the authority that I handed to you guys. So anyway, those of you who have the CD can just simply click on the link and uh, bring this puppy right up. And now you can come over here and you can do a listing on my uh, home directory. Anybody see anything interesting here? Root password.txt. That looked like fun, fun stuff. I have a $20 bill for the guy who can tell me my root password. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, you can see it, but I seem to have forgotten to give you the com cat command on the root password.txt, even though I did give you a cat command on my log file. 
which uh, we can sort of see down here. Okay, so now suppose that you want to turn around and attenuate this even further for somebody else. You can see I already did this once, but I'm going to do it again. So, uh, so I'm going to delegate uh, super limited. Super limited. I'm going to make a delegate. It gives me this new uh, authority down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm just simply going to delete a bunch of the commands. Okay, now I can hand this authority to somebody else and the only commands they can run are these three commands. I can come back up here and I always have a clear visibility into what authorities that I've handed out. Uh, if I were doing this for real, I would have said in my, in my note about this who I was giving it to as well as how limited it was. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, I can revoke it simply by going in there and pressing uh, enabling revocation and pressing the revoke button. Okay. So anyway, so that is our attenuated shell. And that's what it looks like when you use this kind of stuff at the user level. Uh, I've been able to use this. One of the more amusing things that I use this for is I've been able to give my, uh, I have another server that goes down occasionally. So I was able to build an attenuated, uh, uh, attenuated shell for my administrative assistant uh, that allowed her to relaunch the server. Uh, you actually have that authority there on, on your version, the ability to relaunch my server. So if you press that by accident, you may be relaunching the server that I needed to bring back up anyway, so thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, so she can do that, uh, but she can't bring it down. And neither can you. Okay. Okay, let's go on to how this works in larger applications. Uh, this time, uh, uh, we're going to talk about another interesting characteristic of POLA. Okay, people like to talk about defense in depth. POLA is the ultimate poster child for defense in depth. We have, through these examples that we've been running here, we have been achieving POLA at the object level of granularity, okay? Man, are you getting depth of defense when you use POLA at that level. So this is a, a very rude and crude picture of a system that I built, Scoops, the secure cooperative file sharing system. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, system that uh, uh, the closest uh, thing similar to it in the world is Microsoft Live Mesh. The difference is that you need a giant server farm to store all the data in Live Mesh so that the government can come in and read it all. Uh, and in uh, Scoops, it's all peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. There's no central server, so you don't have either the expense or the central point of failure or the, uh, uh, the central point of vulnerability. Let's see, uh, and uh, some of the pieces here, we use a mailbox metaphor, actually. Uh, one of the little things that you get when you set up a scoop system is you get a secure uh, mail-like system. We're not using SMTP. It's got, it uses the mail metaphor, and it's secure. Uh, basically, you send an attachment uh, in an email, and when the guy saves that attachment someplace, when it, whenever either one of you modifies that file and saves your copy on your machine, it automatically updates the other guys, and I don't care how many firewalls are sitting in between you. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so here we have, uh, this is an application built on top of the Waterkin uh, framework. So here we've got the application framework kernel, Waterkin, which is running at full user power. Uh, and it invokes the, uh, the, the part of scoops that launches at the beginning. It, you can think of it as the main. And it is granted all of the authorities that, uh, that the scoop system needs. And then that main starts handing out only the authorities appropriate 
to each one of the things that it invokes. So the PALS manager uh, has references to all the PALS, which is a pretty, pretty powerful authority. But the PALS manager does not have authority to uh, reach the file dialog box, which is able to confer to one with a user action uh, the authority to, to actually read or write a, a file at some location of the user's choosing in the user's uh, space. <clears throat> And then the PAL manager uh, has uh, references to all the PALs. The individual PAL doesn't have a uh, reference to much of anything except the out channel and the in channel for the, particular per for the particular person who is that PAL. The only part of this system that's actually exposed to the outside world with a web key, pretty much, is the in channel. So that makes, the natural that makes it a natural attack vector. The only two real points of exposure for this system are the, in the PAL in-channel and the, uh, 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 the, the, you know, basically a lower level attack on the application framework and the operating system in the TCP IP stack. Uh, and that's a possible attack, but these are all the parts that are, are worked on once very carefully and then host a large variety of applications. The Water Conserver in particular went through a week-long immersive review by a team led by David Wagner. So it's pretty secure as such things go. On the other hand, the entire scoop system was written by me, all by myself. No one's ever reviewed it. Okay, you expect this to be the vulnerable part. So, uh, so in any event, so the, the problem here is that this being the vulnerable part uh, means that you've got to go uh, traipsing through here in order to be able to get any, uh, any power out of it. The only thing that the, the in-channel has the authority to do is to light off the notifier for the email manager with the notification that mail has arrived. Okay, now let's look at this the way software normally works and I'm going to be using models that are so simplified that they make my point too well. And so after having made my point way too well, I'm going to back off and tell you the truth. Okay. So this is a picture of the way most software normally works. Uh, this, is a, this is the uh, normal, simple model of the way software works, which is that all of the objects in a software application are loaded up with enormous amounts of authority, okay? They all have great excesses of abusable authority. And so uh, basically uh, breaching any one part is as good as breaching any other one part. Uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, the basic model that Ross Anderson used to prove that security is impossible for economic reasons, okay? Uh, and uh, so basically, so you've got this series of, of, of pieces that you can reach more or less uh, running through here. And you've got a 20, if you've got a 20% risk of uh, the guide finding a breach in each one of these major pieces, by the time you've ORed them all together, you've got a 63% probability of a breach. Okay, you're, basically you're screwed. Uh, now on the other hand, let's take a look at this. Uh, when we're running it under POLA, defense in depth, and now all the really hot authorities are back here in the application uh, framework kernel. Uh, even breaching the main doesn't buy you a lot of exciting authorities. Uh, and, so, and so what you've got to do is you've got to breach this guy to the point where he will, uh, breach this guy to the point where he will breach this guy, breach this guy, and finally reach this guy. In the last picture, we ORed all of those risks together. This time, we get to AND them together. And the consequence is, if you AND all those 20% risks together, you get a 0.008% chance of a breach. Now, like I said, it's not actually this good. However, here are some things that I'm starting to be able to say with more confidence, having built, uh, Scoops is now the largest system I know of that has been built uh, basically following these principles. Uh, it's got about 15,000 lines of code. Uh, I've done some informal assessments 
uh, and it looks like uh, somewhere between uh, around 60, the way I wrote it, uh, about 60% of the code just simply does not have enough authority to be dangerous and you don't ever have to look at it. And by just changing a few things about my coding style, I could have lifted that up to about 80%. At that point where 80% where of the code simply does not have enough authority to be interesting, uh, you're looking at getting a factor of five increase in the value of the dollar that you put into security review because you're only review, you only have to review 20% of the code. Uh, we, have, we have experiences pointing in this direction going back to uh, the beginning of the century uh, when David Wagner did a security review of an earlier system and you can read his review in which he talks about this, this very interesting characteristic. Uh, <clears throat> the next interesting thing is under maintenance you get a reliable improvement in security as you move forward. The reason is that in general under maintenance you're adding lots of new software out along the edge and along the edge, it turns out that the software generally needs very little authority. So you're adding a lot of code that doesn't have enough authority to be dangerous, while meanwhile you're fixing the security vulnerabilities in the inner core. And so you're reliably moving forward. It actually does get better. Finally, okay, even though you're not going to get to the kind of whopping improvement to 0.008% risk of security breach I was talking about earlier, you're getting a big improvement. This is no longer low-hanging fruit. And last but not least, even though it's not, not as big as a 0.008% risk, it is a fundamental change, a fundamental change in the rules governing the relative advantage of the defender and the attacker. So here's rule number four. Do not play by the enemy's rules. You know, uh, I had uh, seven delightful years during which uh, every year for some different reason, some different organization would ask me to write viruses. And uh, it was satisfying work. Uh, you could always tell that you were making progress because it was so easy. Uh, but every once in a while I'd think, so what would, I, what would I do to make it easier for me to attack a system? You know, what sort of uh, propaganda would I try to brainwash programmers with to make my job easy? And I came up with a number of very interesting uh, strategies. The first one would be to tell people to use C and C++ for their code. Okay, uh, just a delightfully hazardous language, a very satisfying opportunity for the attacker. Uh, I particularly make sure that they understand that automated garbage collection always causes terrible performance problems and causes your program to pause for seconds at a time in the middle of the most important operation. And uh, and that, so it is consequently at most important to use C and C++ any time that you're writing code that has root privilege. Okay, okay. These are really important rules to help the attacker. I would, as an attacker, embrace complicated security toolkits. Subtle APIs with lots and lots of features. I would join the committees and help them add new options that are subtly different from each other to maximize the confusion in the mind of the programmer, giving me more opportunity. And of course, I would make sure that the security software is something that you write separately from writing the main software that does the work and encourage the programmers that since it's being separate, why they can write it last and they can slide it in as a module. I would not mention that the place where you slide it in is as a module right between the quality module and the reliability module. I wouldn't mention that part. <clears throat> and I looked at those rules and I thought, wow, we're following them. Are we, are we the victims of a conspiracy? Did we do this? to ourselves? Well, 
So we need to take, uh, we need to take a page from Buffy Summers and James T. Kirk. Okay, James T. Kirk, Kobayashi Maru. Okay, what he did was he changed the rules so that somebody could win the unwinnable game. Buffy Summers in season three, her, her, her mother makes the criticism that every security person needs to pay attention to. Okay, at one point in season three, Joyce says to Buffy, but what's your plan? You go out every day, you kill a bunch of uh, bad guys, and then the next day there's more bad guys. You can't win this way. You need a plan. And finally, Buffy, in the last episode of the last season, comes up with a plan. She changes the fundamental physics of her universe to permanently favor the defender. What could be lazier than forcing the other guy to play by your rules? OK, laziness. It's not just a good idea. It's a requirement. Because laziness will stand by you. It will be your friend, no matter what the circumstances. But to, but, but to make laziness really work for you, to really rise to the top of your game in the laziness field, you need to be using the right tools. And in particular, you need to be using tools that fully support laziness. Uh, notably, tools that turn OO best practice into enforced security. Tools like Kaha and Joey and the Waterkin web key. You need to learn a little bit about the patterns of secure cooperation. And there are documents that you can read or you can ask me about these patterns. And you have a number of people now here at Google who are experts in these patterns as well. And above all, you have to make them play by your rules. Don't, don't play their game anymore. It is time to stop working so hard. Let us work securely instead. Thank you. What questions does anyone have? Hi. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, okay. The first one, if you go back to the slide where you're talking about anding the risks together. Yeah. Um, are you assuming that somebody can't attack the framework kernel directly? Because otherwise, how does your risk get below 5%? Oh, uh, the reason why the framework kernel got a lower uh, risk factor on this slide. No, no, I'm sorry, on the next slide. Oh. Where you get the 0.08% chance of breach. Why isn't that a 5% chance of breach? Because I can just attack the kernel directly. Oh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the so, so there are two ways that you can attack the kernel. One is by doing a direct attack on it externally. OK, which it's uh, pretty resistant to because of the security reviews. That's, that's one kind of an attack you can do. Uh, the, the application that's running on top of it has ways of interacting with it that are different from what you can do from the outside. Your ability to just hammer it from the outside is really very limited, right? I mean, all you can do is submit things with web keys that are bad web keys and see if you can expose some sort of a failure. Uh, but if you can actually cause the main to, uh, to, to make calls of your choosing on the uh, framework, then you're in a better position to try to exploit something. So yes, there's, there's an attack vector uh, uh, for attacking the, the framework directly from the outside. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about that part. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, you know, the, the extra, extra vulnerability that you get by coming down through the very poorly reviewed uh, application running on top of it. OK. Uh, the second question I had was, if you go back to your secure purse example. Yeah. Um, is it possible to corrupt the integrity of the purses by subclassing the purse X class? and passing in something with a, a negative balance that you've constructed? Um, the, um, uh, For, like, let's say I, I call a deposit, I hand you my own subclass, a purse, it's got a negative balance. 
Right. Uh, well, yeah, one of the things that I didn't mention, although I did put it on the slide, is that this is actually only uh, this particular implementation, which fits on a PowerPoint slide, is only secure if you run it uh, standalone on a separate, on its own Waterkin server and its own JVM, and so nobody is in a position to manufacture a new subclass of the purse. If okay. you're going to, if you're going to do something like, if you're going to run a purse in a shared memory environment with other things going on. You need to do a fancier version of this. Uh, you can go read the original uh, uh, document on the PURSE protocol uh, published in Financial Cryptography 2000 or 2001. So the basic idea of what you're saying is that is that, that line 34 where you're casting to the PURSE says, no, this is really a PURSE. It isn't a subtype or something masquerading as a PURSE. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I know that because of the rules that I set up for this particular example. OK, thanks. And again, there, there, is, a, there is a solution that does, the, that does the job more generally, but uh, it didn't fit on a slide. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, one of the hobgoblins that you didn't directly address is the hobgoblin of singletons and more generally um, mutable static state. Yes, mutable static state is a bad thing. Uh, I know that in Joe E for the, J for the Java verifier that ensures capability security, uh, it will reject programs that have static mutable state. Uh, I would hope that you can tell me what uh, Kaha does with this. Well, it's not really a question of what Kaha does, but I'm trying to address your issue about the laziness. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, it is fairly true that Programs written with mutable static state can be far lazier to write than in, programs without. In the amateur, yeah, it, it, it's far more amateur, it, it, so, la lazy in the amateur sense. Right. It, it, it does not merely violate security principles. It also violates Good fundamental object-oriented design principles, which actually protect professional levels of laziness. Right. The, the problem that we get, though, is that um, what the argument that one makes to people is to say, things will be better in the long term if you adopt this good practice. Now, the history of human enterprise over the millennia mm -hmm. is that people do not look out for their long-term interest. They rush in foolishly and deal with the miseries later. Um, I mean, I'm just presenting this as one of the foundational problems that the things you are talking about are up against. That's um, true. It's That's something true. that comes up again and again. And, um, and I think it has more to do with human behavior. And yeah. yeah. Well, all I can hope for at the moment is to see this group of people uh, who look like they're pretty lazy to me, you know, raise their game into professional levels of laziness, okay, and leave a their amateur statuses behind and go for it. That's fair. Okay. <laughs>